Father, we thank you for your love and your mercies. We thank you for your patience. And we pray as we discuss your word and the spirit of prophecy that we may understand what it takes to break through to carnal hearts. Help us to remember that we once did not understand very much. Even now, we're still groping so that you can teach us. Bless us as we see more clearly the issues for today and how to be a faithful child. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. In 1980, we know that the Seventh-day Adventist Church took a turn. But we may not know how bizarre 1980 really was. In 1980, the General Conference in session, we know, voted 28 fundamental beliefs. For the first time in the history of this church, we officially made some pronouncements. The most obvious one we've been dealing with is about the Trinity. This church never before that officially accepted the Trinity, but in 1980 they did it. There are a couple other things we have not talked about. The atonement. The atonement language was changed. Another one was the creation of the earth. Six days is mentioned, but not a literal six days. Um, I don't want to go through the list, but there are things that were changed, and this church has never been the same since 1980. They took the two apartment language of the sanctuary out. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is because in that very same year, within months, they fired Desmond Ford for preaching those things. Now, isn't that strange? They fired him for teaching those things, and then they made them official. So what did that do? That ensured that all the teachers and the ministers in this denomination would eventually become like Desmond Ford. And that's where we are today. Our men do not hold the spirit of prophecy like the the first church did. They don't hold it that way. As a matter of fact, they think the pioneers were somebody to ignore. These are things that Ford believed. And, it, and the list goes on. But 1980 did that. Now, I happened to have been in, in a place one time where uh, some people asked me to speak on 1844 from the Bible. I said I would do that. Then they called back later and said, well, we have invited Desmond Ford to give the other side. And I, I said, what other side? All right, you can invite anybody you want. It's your meeting. But uh, all I'm going to do is present 1844 from the Bible. That's all I plan to do. They said, okay. So then a few weeks later, they called again and said, well, we have invited... Smuts Van Ryan. Ford did not want to come without him. I said, well, now wait a minute. What are you setting up here? Are we still talking about I will present and they will present? He said, well, no, that's not quite fair. You and them. I said, what do you have in mind? We're going to invite Bill Shea also. So that's two of you and two of them. I said, this is no longer a simple little talk. You're, you're setting up a contest. I don't think I want to do this. And they said, well, uh, this is what's set up, and we've already arranged some of it, so that's where we are. So they called back, and I said, well, look, I'm not going to back away from presenting. I'm not going to get into a debating spirit. I don't believe in that stuff. I will present. We'll see how it goes. They said, okay. So they set it up. Well, after that meeting, Desmond Ford and I had a little private talk. And one of the things he said was, Jesus is not 
in a Christian. And I looked at him, and I was flabbergasted that this this intellectual, this scholar that shook the church could say, Jesus is not in a Christian. So we didn't have very much to say to each other after that. I just asked him a couple of questions about the Spirit, and he didn't respond at all. He just let it go. I knew at that time that he didn't know the truth about Adventism. It was so obvious. So it didn't bother me a lot that he said that. Okay? This Seventh-day Adventist professor that had been fired by the church. So I let it go. I had seen the track of the serpent. And as your life goes on and you're having experiences and different things happen, I became deaf. In uh, Volume 1, Sermons and Talks, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's Sons and Daughters 283. I woke up in the middle of the night last night, and I scribbled a couple things on a little card here, and I took it, but the Lord wants us to talk about this today, so that's what we're doing. Sons and Daughters, page 283, she says, we must learn to see, not only with our eyes, but with our brain. <laughs> okay? Well, when I went deaf, I took that to mean I should learn to hear with my brain. I can't hear with my ears anymore. <laughs> so I must learn how to hear with my ears. And I have learned to do that. And I have learned that that's absolutely necessary. It's the only way I can know what any of you are saying unless you write something. I must be able to hear you with my ears. You can't read words. You have to hear them. Okay? So, a deaf person deals with deafness that way. They hear without ears. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is because just recently I heard the hiss of the snake, the serpent. The same words that I had heard Desmond Ford say. Only this time it was not Desmond Ford. I received a mail this week And I would like to read just a few of the words here. This person was asking, when he, Jesus, is to dwell in our hearts by faith, does that mean we have his attitude towards righteousness, which is something desirable, and his attitude towards sin, which is to hate it, but he himself isn't actually in us, but close to us, and influencing us. Now, this is a friend that I know his whole Christian life has known better. And so he's asking me something out of the blue, but it's not out of the blue. He now tells me why he's asking. He says, I asked because Pastor so-and-so. Oh, he got this from a pastor. Pastor so-and-so was saying that Jesus doesn't actually get inside of us. But he gets close and speaks to our hearts. I thought that when Jesus talks about the Father in him and he is in the Father, Jesus is describing a very intimate relationship between him and his Father. And that extreme close range intimacy was severed for the first time when Jesus hung on the cross. The pastor said, that the Father and the Son don't get inside of one another. I've been thinking that a Christian is someone who had Jesus inside him or herself. If I am not properly representing the relationship, please tell me so. 
Thank you. I heard the hiss. And I'm deaf. Jesus does not live inside a Christian. From a pastor. Well, that that jogged my brain. I didn't sleep most of the night after I got this. Because my mind is telling me it's coming together in the way that I didn't dig it with it publicly, but it's coming together because I have known this spiritually. I have known that the Trinity logically leads to certain thoughts. I heard it in Desmond Ford, and now I've heard it in this pastor. Logically, you have to go to that position that Jesus, who is in heaven, cannot be in a Christian. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is not Jesus, it's somebody else. And if anybody isn't a Christian, it's not Jesus. Do you see that? Logically, you have to arrive at that. But the Bible doesn't deal with logic. It's dealing with reality. It's dealing with revelation. And the reason a person believes in the Father and in the Son is because the Bible says so. Not because it makes any kind of sense. Who can understand all of this? We believe it because the Father and the Son have declared it in the Word of God. So, we then are facing something in the content of this letter. This letter is a call. It's a call for truth. And we have to deal with the concept. We don't want to deal in personalities. We don't want to deal in opinions. We don't want to deal in anything other than the Word of God and the Spirit of Prophecy. And this demands a response from the Word of God and from the Spirit of Prophecy. One, sermons and talks. Now we're there. Okay, 343. Now remember, this is a sermon. Ellen White is saying this. She's not writing it. Thus I worked and suffered in my girlhood. And all through my life I have had the same errors to meet, though not always in the same form. In living temple, what's the error she's dealing with? The personality of God. Who God is. The Trinity, that's where Kellogg went. He became a Trinitarian. She said, I've had to meet those kinds of errors my whole life since a little girl. In Living Temple, the assertion is made that God is in the flower, in the leaf, in the sinner. But God does not live in the sinner. Well, if God doesn't live in anybody, why would she have to say that? Do you see what she's doing to the idea that Jesus does not live in a Christian? She's demolishing it with just that one sentence. God does not live in the sinner. The Word declares He abides only in the hearts of those who love Him and do righteousness. So God does live in somebody. He abides in those who love Him and do righteousness. God does not abide in the heart of the sinner. It is the enemy who abides there. Now to me that's very clear. Now I did not read you the first part of the letter where my friend mentions The pastor does not live in a Christian. What did the pastor just say? 
Jesus does not live in me. That's what he just said. He believes Jesus does not abide in him. And of course, the next step from that is, and he doesn't live in you either. That's his message. As a Seventh-day Adventist minister, that's his message. The church is paying this man tithe to give that message to people that Jesus doesn't live in them. 4 MIR 57. The work of the Creator as seen in nature reveals His power. But nature is not above God, nor is God in nature as some represent Him to be. God made the world, but the world is not God. Okay, this is this is to Kellogg, by the way. She says before that he sitteth upon his throne in the heavens. So God is someplace. He's somewhere. That's not what Kellogg was saying. He was saying he's everywhere. <laughs> so God is somewhere. And Jesus as a human is somewhere. But by His Spirit, He can be anywhere He wants. But not by another Spirit. It's by His Spirit. That's the important part here. She says, I would not dare to speak of God as Dr. J. H. Kellogg have spoken of Him. He is high and lifted up and His glory fills the heavens. The voice of the Lord is mighty. My brother, when you are tempted to speak of God where He is or what He is, remember that on this point silence is eloquence. Take off your shoes from off your feet. For the ground on which you are placed in your careless, unsanctified feet is holy ground. I am instructed to say there is nothing in the Word of God to substantiate your spiritualistic theories. So what did she say Kalag was teaching? Spiritualism. That's what the Trinity turns out to be, according to Alan White. Spiritualism. The Lord has not use for these theories. Okay, I want to start reading from uh, Review and Herald, October 22nd, 1903. This is one of those quiet articles she wrote that kind of sneaks up on you. <laughs> you begin seeing what she's talking about. She says, I have some things to say to our teachers in reference to the new book, The Living Temple. Now, why are we talking about the living temple when a man says Jesus does not live in you? Because the living temple says God is everywhere. And the twist that Satan has put on his spiritualism is that Jesus isn't in anyone. Do you see what he's done? He's turned it around so that logically, if Jesus is not here with us, then he can't be in you. It's the Holy Spirit that's claimed to be here. But even that doesn't work because Trinitarians, if they're going to stay with Trinitarianism, the Godhead cannot be separated according to them, so that the Holy Spirit can't be here either. I'm not I'm not trying to figure out their theology. It can't be Ellen White, as a matter of fact, says it cannot be explained. It's unexplainable. So anybody that tries is in big trouble. It's unexplainable. Okay, let's let's see what she has to say here. Be careful, teachers. How you sustain the sentiments of this book regarding the personality of God. The issue is the personality of God. Today, the ministry doesn't say that. They say the issue is pantheism. No, she doesn't say that pantheism is involved as a side issue. But the issue is the personality of God. 
As the Lord represent matters to me, these sentiments do not bear the endorsement of God. They are a snare that the enemy has prepared for these last days. The snare. Misunderstanding the personality of God. Accepting the Trinity instead of what the Bible says. One true God and His Son Jesus. That's two divine beings. That's it. Alright, let's continue here. She says, as she goes down here, there are ministers, there are teachers, who say, well, he's just saying what you've been saying all these years. And she says, oh, that broke my heart to hear that. She says, he's not at all saying what I'm saying. She says, uh, uh, she says, he says some things that sound like what I'm saying, but he's not saying what I'm saying. She says, God forbid this opinion should prevail. Those who entertain these sophistries will soon find themselves in a position where the enemy can talk with them. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Those who listen to what Kellogg was trying to bring into the church, have placed themselves where Satan can talk to them. Because they're believing Satan's lies. They're not in the Bible. In visions of the night, this matter was clearly presented to me. Before a large number, one of authority was speaking, he said, if the suppositions and statements found in this book were essential, if these statements were pure provender, thoroughly windowed from the chaff, there would be some decided mention of them in the revelation given by Christ to John. Now you think about that for just a moment, that little sentence. That if what Kellogg was presenting because he now believed in the Trinity and he was saying God was in everything. Where is the mention of it in the book of Revelation? She says if, if that was necessary for us to know, Christ would have told John about it and John would have put it in the Revelation. Well, I think you should invite anybody who believes in the Trinity that you bump into to show you that in the book of Revelation because Ellen White says it should be in the book of Revelation. Before that, she said that we are uh, uh, on safe ground discarding anything that Jesus did not teach. What did Jesus teach it? Did he say one plus one plus one equals one? I have never found it. We can discard it. Get rid of it. Ellen White said it's safe to do that. The instruction that he gave is found in the book of Revelation. Now, she begins to quote it. I did not expect her to do that. But now, after having said that, she's going to tell us what's in the book of Revelation according to what God has revealed to her. Here, we, here she goes. Chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things. And she quotes the whole thing. But I want you to notice, the revelation did not come from Jesus. That's what everybody teaches. She says this is the revelation which God gave to Christ to give. So it's the same story as the whole New Testament. Whatever Jesus has, he got from the Father. Christ. The Father gave Jesus a revelation to give to his servants. Okay. Our instructor presented the solemn messages that have been given in their order in Revelation. In their order. We're not going to study that today, but that's very important. The order is important. All through the book, the Living Temple, passages of Scripture are used, but in many instances, these passages are used in such a way that the right interpretation is not given to them. The message for this time is not the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, 
the temple of the Lord are we. What did she just say? Kellogg is telling you, Seventh-day Adventists, you're the temple. We are not the temple of the Lord. Why did she say that? Because we as a people are not doing what God said to do, what to do. Jesus does not live in a sinner. That's what she said before. But he does live in Christians. There are some, those, excuse me, there are those whose minds will be taken up with smooth words and fair speeches. They're going to believe the pastors because it's the pastor talking. She said in her day, she saw Kellogg doing it with the physicians. She saw him doing it with some of the pastors. He he especially appealed to men of science. Smooth words. Fair speeches. He says, but they can't understand them or interpret them. They just believe them because that's who said them. Satan is pleased to see the diversion of minds that should be engaged in the study of the truths that have to do with eternal reality. Will not those who profess to have a knowledge of the truths read the testimony given to John by Christ? Here is no guesswork, no scientific deception. Theology. No science of logic like we read in the book we re looked at last time. Then she goes on to the third chapter of Revelation, unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things say he that had the seven spirits of God. Seven spirits. Does that sound like the Trinity? <laughs> we got from three to seven, didn't we? <laughs> We're not going to do anything with the seven spirits. We can understand what that means. The number seven is very important. But she says, continuing reading about Sardis, and this is something we need to understand. This is for Seventh-day Adventists, even though it's to Sardis. We partake of the Reformation. It was never finished. Okay, here's the words. Remember. Do you, do you think that's an Adventist word? <laughs> Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast. What did we receive when we first became Seventh-day Adventists? The pillars. And as much as the scholars today would like to say, the, the personality of God is not one of the pillars. We can prove it is. We can read it from Ellen White. Remember what thou hast received and heard and hold fast. Don't let it go. Don't change the church in 1980. That's in the Bible. This is her comment. These words were spoken with such strength and force that those present seemed to be afraid and hid their faces in their hands as if they were arraigned before the judge of all the earth. Some seemed about to faint. Well, maybe we ought to read the words to start us someday because they're to Seventh-day Adventists. They're not just to the Reformation. The, then the subject changed. And by the way, this is somebody reading to her from heaven. She's not making this up. She's listening and she's telling the people, this is, this is what happened. The subject changed now, she says. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis. I'm not going to read the rest. Let's, let's leave that right where it is. I want to move on to Philadelphia now. She says, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. This is the true church of God. It's the last church of God in the Bible. It's a church of brotherly love. Why do they love each other? It's because they all believe the same thing. 
They all have the same Lord. They all have the same baptism. They all have the same Spirit. What else can they do but love each other? Christ is not divided. All right. So this is the true church. Right. These things said he that is holy. Now why should God say that to the last church? Because that's the message to the last church. To be holy even as I am holy. That's what God says to his people. So he that is holy, that's our example. He that is true, oh, no falsehood with him. When he says something, it's true. When he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, that's the truth. And it doesn't need a theologian to say, no, that doesn't happen. He that openeth and no man shuts and shutteth and no man opens. Who is trying to get back to the holy place? They had to go back there to find the Trinity because the Trinity is not in the most holy place. She's talking to real Seventh-day Adventists here. I know thy works. These people do not say I'm going to heaven by righteousness by faith. They know the only righteousness by faith in the Bible is obedience. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. That open door was opened by Jesus, and no man can shut it. Thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I make them. Who's the them? It's everybody who's trying to get back to the holy place. Righteousness by faith. With no works. Do away with the law. You don't need it. I'm not going to go through all that. That's another study. But the Church of Philadelphia is telling us a lot of things. Behold, I will make them the ones who do not go into the most holy place of Jesus by faith. I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Christians, which say they're Jews, and are not, but do lie, which I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. The whole world that does not really understand the Bible and keep the Bible and have Jesus inside of them is going to worship at the saints' feet. All of them. They will know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Is that the time of Jacob's trouble? Which shall come upon all the world to try them to dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Is that an Adventist message? Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Don't give up the pioneers, Ellen White. Don't give up Jesus. Don't give up the real Seventh-day Adventist message. That no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh. Oh, so only overcomers are going to heaven in this group. Only overcomers. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar. How can we be a pillar if we're destroyers of the pillars? Do you catch the connection here? The pillar is upholding the sanctuary. A pillar in the temple of... Now listen carefully. A pillar in the temple of... My God. Is that the Trinity? There is no Trinity in the book of Revelation. That's what she said. If Jesus had wanted to preach and teach something, it would have been in the book of Revelation. There is no trinity in the book of Revelation. He says, My God, that's the Father and the Son. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of 
my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Is there a message here? <laughs> and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Notice what she says next. In the speaker, I'm sorry, in these words, there is no soothsaying. What does she mean by that? No spiritualism. This is the truth. These are not the words of Satan. These are the words of God. These are the words of Jesus to his church in the book of Revelation. The speaker held up the living temple. Oh, now the subject's changing again. In this book, there are statements that the writer himself does not comprehend. Many things are stated in a vague, undefined way. Why is that? Because there's no way to explain something that can't be explained. <laughs> and Alan White says it can't be explained. The sophistries regarding God and nature that are flooding the world of skepticism are the inspiration of the fallen foe. Let our teachers beware lest they echo the soothsaying of the enemy of God and man. That's what I heard. I heard the echo of Desmond Ford in a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Jesus did not live in a Christian. I'm not reading this just to be reading something. Ellen White is addressing these issues. But we don't see them unless we understand the truth. That the Father and the Son is what the Bible is all about. Unto the angel of the church of the latest scenes. Oh, do we have to talk about them? Yeah. Do you know there are actually people who teach the Seventh-day Adventist church is the latest scene church? How can that be? Just a slight amount of thinking. Just a little teeny bit. Just a drop or two. How could Jesus say, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth, but I want you to be a lady sin? How could anybody come to that? That makes no sense. But people don't use their heads. They just believe what everybody tells them. That's called a minister anyhow. No, we can't do that. Laodicea is not the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, most of the Seventh-day Adventists may be Laodiceans, but God never designed it that way. Let's look at this. I'm not going to read through that. That's another... It would take me three, three meetings to get through Laodicea to show what's really going on there. At the end of that message, it says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Who's me? That's Jesus, isn't it? There's not a third God. To the last church on earth, Jesus is talking to, and it's not the church. This is a fake church here. This is the fallen church. To the last people on earth, he's trying to stay. He says, I knock at the door. What's the door? Yeah. It's our insides. What does he say he will do if we open the door? He said, I'm going to stand out here and suggest things to you. No. I'm going to get as close as I can. No, he says, I'm going to come in. I'm coming in. Doesn't the pastor know any of these verses? He says, Fire of me, gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich. And white raiment, thou may be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with thy staff, that thou may see. That they may see. I think somewhere before that he said they were blind. That's why they can't see. They're blind. And many times I have thought about that verse. He said, they don't know they're blind. Have you ever met a blind person that does not know he's blind? What kind of a, a condition is that to be blind and not know it? Don't you think that's pretty sad? Don't you think that's pretty tragic? But Jesus says that's 
where the so-called Christians are in the last days before he comes back. They, they're blind, don't even know it. He says, I guess I just got you, I want to spit you out of my mouth. Yeah. What does that mean, spit you out of my mouth? That means he cannot take your love statements to God. He can't do that. He can't ask that you be given grace. He cannot bless your work in the Christian church. You read all of this in volume 6 of the Testimonies, 408. Yeah, it says that. That's what to be a Laodicean is. Open the door. I will come in. Do you remember someplace over there in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter? First Corinthians three sixteen. Paul says, Don't you know? Don't you know? Of course he says it in the King James language here, no ye not. But don't you know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? What are we going to do with a man who doesn't know the Bible says that? And there are many, many people who listen to this man. I don't think he has said this in public yet. He's going to be in big trouble when he does. But he said it to my friend. And I think we ought to be ready to talk to people who get a little bit confused and say, well, I thought Jesus was in us. But now they're saying he isn't. We ought to remember some scriptures. Don't you know? You're the temple of God. That's what the sanctuary message is all about. God says, since you won't let me inside of you, make me a sanctuary in your neighborhood so I can be in that in that box. At least I'll be in your neighborhood. The whole message of the Bible is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the whole message. If we take away Jesus inside of us, what's going to hold us up? Yeah, are you hearing why I said spiritualism? There are two things that spiritualists believe. They're not really Christians, but they call themselves Christians. They're pagans. There are two things that pagan religionists believe. Number one, that God has to save me in my sins because I can never give them up. He has to save me in my sins or I'll become good. How are you going to become good? Well, Jesus is out there encouraging me. He's comforting me. He's suggesting things to me. He's telling me all the good things. And I'll get good. That's works of man without Christ. It does no good to have him out there whispering to you. An external God is useless. And that's what the snake is presenting. He doesn't go inside of you. He's outside suggesting things to you. That's against the gospel. That destroys the atonement. Well, we're, we're starting to get there. CW94. Behold your God. Those are three of my most favorite words. Behold your God. You know that's our message to the world? We think it's the Sabbath. No, it, it isn't the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a test of, for Christians. Our message to the world is behold your God. Now how can we tell them behold your God if we don't know who He is? Behold your God is the Father. 
When we tell people to behold a trinity, what are they going to look at? Nobody has ever been able to visualize a three-headed God. Behold your God. Keep your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And by beholding Him, you will be changed into His likeness. Now, is Jesus our God? Well, of course. He's the only God we've ever seen. <laughs> None of us have ever seen the Father, but we have seen Jesus. We've heard the voice of Jesus. Jesus is our Father. Did you know that? Yes. He's the one who physically created us. He's our Father. So all the attributes of the Father are in Jesus. We have no problem with that. The Sunday keepers are dead wrong when they say that if you say Jesus is begotten, that means he's not deity. They don't know what they're talking about. And neither do any of our scholars who say the same thing. The pioneers took care of that one a long time ago. They said, we all believe in the deity and we all believe that Jesus is begotten. We just need to go back and read their writings. Okay, so it says here, By beholding him, you will be changed into his likeness. Talk not of these spiritualistic theories. Let them not, let them find no place in your mind. Don't pay attention to Kellogg and anything he's saying about the personality of God. Let them find no place in your mind. Let our papers be kept free from everything of the kind. Publish the truth. Do not publish error. Do not try to explain in regard to the personality of God. What is she talking about? You know, even when she says it out plain, people say pantheism. No, she's talking about the personality of God, who he is. Not what he is, she never goes over there. Who he is, that's what she talks about. You cannot give any further explanation than the Bible has given. Human theories regarding him are good for nothing. Do not soil your minds by studying the misleading theories of the enemy. Don't soil your mind. Yeah. She said, when people want to study the Trinity with you, you tell them, go home. I only study the, the truth. Yeah. Why should we study their theories? Ellen White says they're not worth anything. They're good for nothing. So now you know what to do with that paper the church gave you. Let the doctrines of present truth be put into our papers, but give no room to a repeating of erroneous theories. You know, Froome in his wonderful book said that Alan White never used the word Trinity. He said, and, and he can't figure out why. He says, maybe it's because it was too soon. Well, you know, she got to be pretty old. I guess it wasn't too soon after she died. Froome makes up so many strange things. Well, I don't want to get into Froome right now. Let's continue here. First Selected Messages 202. And I have to leave myself room to finish this. First Selected Messages. It's a very, very familiar page. I quoted this long time ago, but it's so long ago we can say it again. Uh, page two or two to begin with. A copy of Living Temple was sent me, but it remained in my library unread. She wouldn't even pick it up. From the light given me by the Lord, I knew that some of the sentiments advocated in the book did not bear the endorsement of God and that they were a snare that the enemy had prepared for the last day. I thought this would surely be discerned. By who? The ministers, the teachers. I thought, well, surely 
if they look at this thing, they'll see it. They'll understand this is from the devil. And that it would not be necessary for me to say anything about it. Oh, well, I said, this will go away. The ministry will take care of it. No. It contains the very sentiments that Sister Wyatt had been teaching. This assertion struck right at my heart. I felt heartbroken. Finally, my son said to me, and you ought to note those down, all the things he recommended to her and suggested to her. They make an interesting picture, what Willie White asked her to do. Yeah. Finally, my son said to me, Mother, you ought to read at least some parts of the book that you may see whether they are in harmony with the light that God has given you. He sat down beside me, and together we read the preface in most of the first chapter, and also paragraphs in other chapters. As we read, I recognized the very sentiments against which I had been bidden to speak and warning during the early days of my public labors. When I first left the state of Maine, it was to go through Vermont and Massachusetts to bear a testimony against these sentiments. Living Temple contains the Alpha of these series. Another place, she says, heresies. I knew that the Omega would follow in a little while. A little while. Four years after she was dead. And I trembled for our people. I knew I must warn our brethren and sisters not to enter into controversy over the presence and the personality of God. What's the issue? She keeps saying it. How did all of our scholars miss it? She keeps saying it. The personality of God. The statements made in the living temple in regard to this point are incorrect. And she was not referring to pantheism only. She was referring to the fact that his foundation of a trinity took him there. But she never uses the word Trinity because in her whole life it never came out of her. Why? I'll answer from question for him. Why didn't she mention it? Because it's not in God's vocabulary. None of the prophets in the Bible ever used that word or the concept. None of the Apostles ever did. Jesus never used the word. Nobody in the Bible ever used it. Alan White never used it. God has never used the word. No one can prove he has ever used the word. It's not in his vocabulary. It's a word straight out of Satan's mind. The personality of God. Well, I'm going to have to leave it for now. I was going to try to mark it. I am compelled to speak in denial of the claim that the teachings of Living Temple can be sustained by statements from my writings. The spiritualistic theories regarding the personality of God, the spiritualistic theories Sweep away the entire economy of God, of Christianity. In other words, what, what was being fostered by Kellogg destroyed not only Seventh-day Adventism, It destroys all of Christianity. Has it done it? Think about that for a second. Who are the Trinitarians? Who gave it to the Seventh-day Adventists? Who gave it to them? Brooke tells us in his book, Moving the Destiny, page 322, he says that because there was nothing in our literature, he went to the men, not of our faith, 
the Sunday Keepers. So the Sunday Keepers taught us about the Trinity. What do the Sunday Keepers believe? Sunday? Immortality of the soul? Everlasting burning now? You go through the list. It's quite a list of things they believe. Their God, the Sunday God, is the Trinitarian God, has swept away the entire Bible from them. They don't believe anything the Bible says, even justification by faith. Their justification by faith ends right there. They have no sanctification by faith. They do not believe in the law of God. Satan has swept away the entire Christian economy from the Sunday keeping world. And now he's working us. And that's what she just said. The spiritualistic theories that come out of the Trinity regarding the personality of God followed to their logical conclusion. Do you remember Whedon using that word? It's logical. It's not in the Bible, but it's logical. Sweep away the whole Christian economy. You just wiped out Christianity. The devil knows what he's doing. They make of no effect the truth of heavenly origin and rob, oh I missed that, let me put that in here, and rob the people of God of their past experience. It takes away the first 50 years. Does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> She's telling us the whole story. Giving them instead a false science. Will they permit this man? Back then it was just one man, Kellogg. Now it's uh, the people who run the church. Will they permit this man to present doctrines that deny the past experience of the people of God? We could rephrase that whole question now. Will we let the people since 1980 who changed the church take away the experience of Seventh-day Adventists in the first 50 years? Well, the church has allowed it. They've done it. The people know nothing about any of this. She says, our religion would be changed. Okay, I think maybe that's enough on that one. You're familiar probably with the rest of it. That's also in Special Testimonies. Uh, number two. Um, special Testimonies number two, since I mentioned it, page 51 is where she says what Kellogg was doing is unexplainable. She says, don't even try. She says, I can't explain it. People have asked me, so I can't do it. It's unexplainable. Well, when a person tries to get you to explain the Trinity, you just tell them, it's unexplainable. <laughs> no one has ever explained it. It's not possible. YRP 234. That's a good one. Okay, I have to start winding up here. Many theories were advanced bearing a semblance of truth, but so mingled with misinterpreted, misapplied scriptures that they led to dangerous errors. Very well do we know how every point of truth was established and the seal set upon it by the Holy Spirit of God. And all the time voices were heard, here is the truth, I had the truth, follow me. But the warnings came, go ye not after them. I have not sent them. The leadings of the Lord were marked. Okay, I don't see the, the sentence I'm looking for. But that brings up a good point for us to think about. Mingle. That word mingle should take it somewhere. What was the very first sin humankind ever did? The tree. The tree that mingled truth and error. 
As soon as they ate of that tree, they were sinners and were lost. When a person mingles truth with error, they're eating from the tree again. Knowledge of good and evil, and you cannot be saved mingling truth and error. Because error never sanctifies. That's another subject we could spend a lot of time with. But I want to finish what we're doing here today. We have tried to point out here that Jesus must be in a human being or they cannot Obey God. Every Christian should know that. It's impossible to obey God unless the Spirit of Christ is in them. Our problem is not that we don't have enough information. <laughs> I don't need Jesus standing right here telling me the real things, the real truth, and now I can do it. Because it doesn't matter how loud he talks or how long, I'm still not going to be able to do it. What's my problem? It's my nature. I'm a sinner. And sinners by themselves are incapable of obedience to God because they do not have a spiritual life. The only way I can have a spiritual life is for Jesus to come and live in me and give me. It's called partaking of his divinity. Now, he can do that. I don't want to get into deep water here because he became a man. He lived a perfect human life. He had a perfect human spirit. And when he went to heaven, he took that manhood back to him, this perfect manhood and because he was successful and he is now, once again, the uh, omnipresent God by his spirit, he can come to me in that spirit and give me his perfect manhood. He does not give me his perfect divinity so that I can be divine. That never happens. But see, since he is one person, mysteriously blended man and divinity that when he comes to me I get all of him. I get all of him. One person. Human and divine I participate in divinity but what he gives me that I can live is his perfect manhood. That's what he gives me. But he gives it to me inside not outside. You're going to have to think about that because I don't know if you heard that just that way before. But Jesus lived a perfect life so he could be our example, our substitute, and he could give us that perfect manhood. Ellen White calls it character. She says his gift to us is his character. Not as God, but as a perfect man. So we have no excuse in this world. Paul says, that Jesus condemns sin in the flesh. So that proves I can do it. That proves I can do it because he did it. If I was to do it the same way he did. How did he do it? He had the Father's Spirit in him. He couldn't have done it as a man unless the Father's Spirit was in him. And that's what the pastor is denying. Jesus showed us the way. Get the Spirit of God in you. Now, there's a whole lot to this subject, but I hope you understand this far that to say anything differently than Jesus is in you, the, the hope of glory, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ lives in me. 
Now how does the man lose that scripture? <laughs> Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the the faith. The faith. What is that? The faith of the Son of God. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The faith. The faith. We haven't been saying it right. Let's close with uh, Jude one three. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, the only one is what he's talking about. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that means once and for all. So what did Jude say? That the real Christians in this world are to contend for the faith. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. How many people did he mention there? Commandments of God and faith of Jesus. The very essence of the Seventh day Adventist message is God and his son Jesus. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. There's nothing else. There's no third one in there. When are we going to become Seventh-day Adventists again? Well, it's not going to be by keeping the fundamental beliefs. I'm sorry. Somebody really messed up with those and they just did it again. I think I mentioned somewhere they were going to do it again. It doesn't. I don't have a prophet's license. I didn't get it punched. I just know they're not going to change overnight. <laughs> okay? The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that's Jesus inside of you, not outside. Father, we thank you for your word. We hardly touched the spirit of prophecy today. There's so much in the spirit of prophecy on this subject. It's impossible not to see this in the spirit of prophecy. Bless us. As this becomes more and more real to us. and Let us be in a place where we can help other people. The confusion is mounting. The Trinity confuses people. The Trinity God never teaches the truth. Help us. To have Jesus in us. So that we have the love that works by love and purifies the soul. We thank you in his holy name. Amen.